So maybe Rudy, you could bring up the next speaker's slides while I introduce him. Um, so I could have just done a simple intro um, of uh, Larry Tabak, um, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to keep it simple because, to be honest with you, I think Larry deserves more um, than a simple introduction to this council. I'll, I will start with some general biographical details because uh, not all members of council or everybody watching might know uh, a lot about Larry, but, uh, but some of you probably do. Um, he has a, a DDS degree, a doctor of dental surgery, and also a PhD. He and I share a, 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 a long-term interest in glycosylation. That was my previous life as a graduate student. I then changed fields, but Larry is a distinguished scholar and researcher uh, in, in glycosylation. Um, he uh, has other, uh, other uh, professional experience before coming to NIH, a former senior associate dean and a professor at the University of Rochester, a former NIH merit awardee, and a member of the National Academy of Medicine. But important to the discussion about NIH is when he came here in 2000 as the director of uh, the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, uh, a position he served for the better part of a decade. And during that time, increasingly took on trans-NIH roles, helped standing up you know, the Common Fund, helping instrumentally with the ERA stimulus package, and I could go on a long list of things where he was called into to, to really help um, at a trans-NIH level. Um, by 2009, uh, he became the acting principal deputy director under Francis Collins, and uh, shortly after I became director of NHGRI, then in 2010, he was officially appointed the principal deputy director. And so needless to say, ever since, I've served as one of the uh, 27 institute and center directors um, with uh, Larry extensively interacting along with Francis with all of us as directors. I mean, this is uh, not a meeting goes by where it's not both Francis and Larry helping shepherd the set of things that we constantly have to deal with. And that's where I want to make a few comments. Instead of just saying he's the deputy director, I really want to tell you what a terrific deputy director he is. I'll start off by saying that he's a great mentor to me. Uh, he's sort of had about a 10-year head start as an institute director, and I've looked to him on many occasions and, and taken a lot of lessons about how to navigate all sorts of complicated issues at a senior leadership position at NIH. Um, we've also worked at many projects together um, and continue to do so to the present time, things he's had to play major leadership for trans NIH level around data science, for example, and others. Um, where he's, uh, he and I have interacted extensively and, and, and dealing with some very tough issues. Um, and, and just watching him uh, work in this very challenging set of, 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 of circumstances and issues that come to the leadership of NIH, um, uh, n many of which actually get solved and not even come into the NIH Institute Directors, but then many that do come where we have to think as a group and how to navigate them in a very diplomatic and thoughtful way. And, and watching him help do that and leading us through that. Um, some of the things aren't so much fun, and some of the things that Larry has been assigned to take leadership on, he'll be the first to admit, aren't all the fun stuff, because if it was really easy, it wouldn't need him. It's the hard stuff that needs him, whether it's ethics issues or whether um, other crises that come up or just significant problems. Um, and it, but watching him uh, has just been a very good learning experience for myself, and I know I speak for the other institute and center directors. Um, uh, just it really helps us learn what we're going to have to face and continue to face in these leadership positions. I'd also joke by pointing out that the other thing he and I share, and we sometimes joke about, is is you know for a long many years I was a senior leader under in an institute this institute under Francis Collins, and now he has that responsibility under Francis, and Francis is. Uh, Difficult at times. He's wonderful, but he's difficult. And every once in a while, Larry will say to me, well, you know Francis, and you know how he, and that's absolutely true. And so we sort of share that, that spirit as well. So all of this is a long-winded way of introducing uh, the Principal Deputy Director Larry Tabak to you, who's here to talk about one of many, many issues he's dealing with, and that's this Next Generation Researchers Initiative. But also to say a big thanks to him, this is an example of somebody that most people don't realize is incredibly vital to NIH. It's uh, a lot of stuff he does is behind the scenes, um, but, but NIH prospers uh, because of his contributions. I can guarantee you NHGRI benefits both at the institute level and then people like me and others who, who deal with Larry on a lot of hard pro problems. I don't think he gets enough recognition, so I want to use this opportunity to do so, and I want a counsel to hear me say those words and people listening in because I think Larry deserves every one of them. So welcome, Larry, and thank you for everything you do. Well, thank you. Um, that was um, 
certainly an overly kind introduction. Uh, typically, when I show up at NIH, people think bad news is about to beset them. Um, and the other reaction I get is slumping of shoulders, because it means that Francis couldn't be there and he sent me instead. So, um, so I, I, but, but I do thank you, Eric, for those, those very kind of words. Um, so, um, let me just give you some of the background uh, to uh, this effort, um, which I think is familiar to all of your council members and certainly all of your staff. Um, as part of uh, an NIH-wide strategic plan, um, NIH um, articulated our need to enhance the stewardship of our agency. And to do that, of course, uh, workforce uh, is, is a very integral piece to that, both in terms of recruiting and retaining great people, uh, but also to, to enhancing the workforce diversity. And all of that goes hand in hand, of course. Um, now, many members of the extramural community um, have um, observed uh, some of the challenges that, that we face um, um, in, in biomedical research today. And, and this perspective, authored by Bruce Alberts and colleagues in PNAS, uh, summarizes a, a good deal of the sentiment that's being expressed in the community, and that is, to just to paraphrase, that people think that this biomedical research enterprise will go on forever um, in terms of growth. Uh, but that, unfortunately, we've, we've created a system in recent years that is, as they term, hyper-competitive. And that hyper-competition uh, is, is unfortunately discouraging many of the young people who we would very much like to attract uh, to, to uh, biomedical research. Um, and, and, and because all of this is not sustainable, if we don't do something um, and, and, and soon, um, the whole enterprise is placed in, in jeopardy. Um, so, again, this is from Nature, but there are many similar articles uh, in, in the uh, scientific press uh, as to what young scientists are saying, um, and, and none of this should come as a surprise to any of you. Um, there's this never-ending pursuit for the next, uh, you know, funding opportunity. Uh, it leaves uh, not as much time for science as people would like. Um, in some instances, extreme competition has prompted uh, folks to at least contemplate uh, cutting corners. Um, in many instances, the system has, has evolved into an over-dependence on, on senior investigators. You know, there is a fine line between mentorship and over-dependence. Um, and, um, and of course, we haven't helped, we meaning the government, we meaning institutions who are risk-averse, in piling on administrative uh, requirements on top of each other. Um, uh, and so uh, no one went into this business seeking a nine-to-five job, but, but not to do some of the things that, that we insist that our folks do. This slide uh, def defines for you what I mean by hyper-competition. Um, the lower curve in red are the number of awardees from 2003 to 2015. And, and most people um, are quite surprised that that number has been relatively stable throughout that period. Um, it's, it's basically a flat line. Um, what is not surprising, of course, is the upper curve in blue. That's the number of applicants, and that number just keeps going up and up. And the delta between these two curves, of course, represents competition, but in an ex extreme hyper-competition. Um, and so again, just returning to the media, um, this was an article that appeared in the New York Times back in uh, July of 2016, and this individual just sort of stating what you all know, that the average age for an independent award has crept up. Um, my first award was in 79, and I was 
I'm 29 years old. I mean, it, it, I'm 65. You don't have to do the math. Um, <laughs> but um, it, it's, um, and of course, that's just not the case anymore. And, and so, the, and the tendency, as, as she articulates, is for grants to go to scientists who already have them, making it harder and harder to break into the system. So NIH, of course, is intensely aware of this and concerned about this. And what we have here is a display of the age of investigators funded by NIH separated somewhat arbitrarily into three age cohorts. Um, and so let me begin with the good news. The lower curve in blue, um, and I'm a proud member of this cohort for many years now. I revealed that to you a few moments ago. Um, my cohort is doing great. So hooray for us, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, not surprising to any of you is this middle curve, the red curve, which is a display of early career. And this is, again, arbitrarily described as being 45 years or younger. Um, and they, unfortunately, had a precipitous decline, finally leveling off when NIH put into place the early stage investigator policy, which sought to normalize success rates among the um, more established and early stage investigators. And that sort of leveled off, but it hasn't rebounded. And then finally, there's the upper curve in green. And this is the one that really caught our attention and has gotten us a little worried. Again, arbitrarily, mid-career, 46 to 60. Next year, I'll think it should be 46 to 65, but that's just human nature. Um, but that said, you know, this sort of reached a peak, and now it seems to be declining. And, and that's of concern to us. And all of you can think of people in your own institution who, you know, have had an NIH grant, were doing fine, just missed their award, now are struggling to get that award, you know, uh, funded. And depending on the institution that you are working in, you may or may not have the resiliency to support that individual until he or she gets back their grant. And in some instances, the, you know, catastrophic occurs, they have to leave. They, they, they have no, no longer a position. Now, this is not just baby boomer demographics. That, that's the first impulse. People look at this and go, well, you boomers are getting old. And look, to all of you in the audience, we will eventually wear out. And now I see smiles. I won't tell you who Eric is smiling the broadest, but there are smiles, particularly from the back of the room there, although a few people around the council table, too. Um, multiple analyses indicate that the reason this is happening is that established PIs are outcompeting other groups. And it's not that they're getting better scores. It's they're outcompeting because of resiliency. So let me d describe that a bit. Two investigators, one established, one newly minted, each just missed getting their R01 funding. The person who is well established likely has another award or two or three or four to fall back on. And yes, we know you only spend your resources on the exact project that you are funded for, right? That even elicited broader smiles, but okay, that's fine. Um, and so, and so, and then the additional thing is, if you've been at an institution for 10 or 20 or 30 or more years, you probably know where there's some resources tucked away institutionally that you might be able to draw on and so on and so forth. If you're newly minted, this was probably your only award, highly likely it was your only award, and you're less likely to have access to resources that the institution may be able to provide. And so the, 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 the more established individual can hang in there until their, you know, application, you know, finally gets supported. Now, this is something that I'm sure members of council know. Um, it's not something that all of the junior investigators know. It's a lot easier uh, to, you know, get a grant renewed than it is to get the grant initial. Uh, once you're in the system, it, it you know, success begets some level of success. And so 
These are success rates over time, the upper curve in blue, renewals, so-called type 2s, the lower curve in red, so-called type 1s, the new, the new awards. Um, so when you take all of this together, we, we feel that there are issues that NIH has got to become more proactive about in, in dealing with. And this also dovetails with another element in our need to enhance stewardship, and that is to optimize approaches to inform funding decisions. Now, I'm sure Eric and his staff have, uh, you know, articulated for you the process that this particular institute goes through as you contemplate, you know, what application to fund and, more difficultly, what applications not to fund. Um, but, but indeed, there is some heterogeneity across the agency, and, and it behooves us to continually uh, revisit how we do this to inform those funding decisions. So that's sort of the, the local backdrop. And then in the 21st Century Cures Act, which is this remarkable piece of legislation passed in the most bipartisan of ways, which provided NIH with an enormous addition to the resources that we are able to draw upon. But it also directs the NIH director to promote policies that will promote earlier independence and increase funding for new investigators. And indeed, um, it indicates that within the office of the director, the, quote, next generation of researchers initiative uh, needs to be established through which the director will coordinate all policies and programs with NIH that are focused on this goal of providing opportunities for new researchers, and importantly, to get them independent sooner. And being independent is not the same thing as, as being a super postdoc in a professor's laboratory. And I, I know you all appreciate that distinction. So. Um, Recently, um, we um, published in the NIH guide uh, the uh, formal policy supporting the Next Generation Researchers Initiative. Now, at all councils except this one, I call this the Next Gen in Initiative. Now, here, Next Gen has a whole different meaning, um, but I, so I apologize in advance, but I'm referring, of course, to this, this initiative if I slip into that jargon. Um, so how do we do this? Um, you know, how, how can we possibly increase the number of early career funded investigators? Now, now again, you've all done the calculus. Um, it, we have a finite resource set. And no matter how we slice it and dice it, we have a finite resource set. And so the money's got to come from someplace. Um, and so in, in, in thinking this through, and this really was, uh, Eric alluded to, the discussions that the Institute and Senate directors have with Francis and his staff, these discussions went over, uh, on with, with members of, uh, you know, Institute and Center directors with, with the uh, OD staff multiple times. And I will say they were just like the best lab meeting you ever at attended. There were no rules. There was lots of food thrown around. And, um, you know, people let it loose as to what they really felt and, and so forth. And in the end, I think we came up with something that, that, is, that is certainly reasonable. Um, so the, we decided that one thing we can do is we can further enhance the prioritization of the early stage investigators program. We, we know that this can be effective because it's what prevented this precipitous decline that I'm uh, tracing here with the pointer. Um, but it just hasn't gone far enough in our view. We would like to see an upturn um, over the next um, several years. Um, and so the definition of ESI is articulated here. Um, again, we appreciate that there's a certain arbitrariness to this. And we've received multiple emails from people who are 11 years out or 10 years in one day out from, you know, their, their training and so forth. But again, you, you have to, you know, draw the line somewhere with the understanding that institutes and centers have the latitude to fund who they think should be funded. And, and so it's not that we're saying don't fund anybody who is 
10 years and one day out. But, but this is the policy that, a, that an ESI would be considered uh, 10 years out from their, their final training. And the goal that we have for 2017 um, is to fund about 200 more ESI awards than we did in 2016. And that's across the whole of NIH, not just for the Genome Institute, although if you want to, you know, no, no okay. Um, now, the, the other thing is, the other cohort that we're really worried about, and we haven't formally articulated this uh, across the agency, although individual institute and centers have, um, are the so-called early established investigators. So this is the person on your faculty who got his or her award as an ESI, um, but now is in danger of losing all support, um, and it's because they just missed. And there's a lot of people in this circumstance. And as a former research dean, uh, I still remember how much we invested in, in, in a new investigator and the extraordinary loss in that investment if we, if, if we faced the dilemma of having to have somebody leave the institution because of loss of funding. I mean, we used to do everything possible to prevent that from happening. But the truth is, today, it's a very different world, and many institutions don't have nearly the flexibility that we did back in the you know mid '90s. Um, it's it's just different now, and, and 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 except for a few, you know, unique and, and fortunate places, many institutions just don't have the wherewithal. Um, they want to do the right thing. It's just they you know they don't have it. Um, so we, we view these people as, as really greatly at risk and, and, and a place where additional investment has to be made to really save, uh, you know, the, the, the tremendous investment that NIH has made, that institutions have made, society has made, and so forth. So again, the goal for 2017 is to fund about 200 more of these types of folks. And so together, it's an additional 400 um, when, when, when you think about the numbers. Now, look, one of the, the conundrums we got into, and, and those of you who followed this closely with the so-called grant uh, support index, the GSI, uh, know that um, it's, a, it's an age-old problem that we face as a funding agency and that you face at your own institutions. Um, how do you assess the value of the investments being made. Um, as a research dean, you know, who do you give additional space to? As an NIH institute or center director, to whom do you award the next grant and to whom do you not award it? Um, now, no one would, would argue with, with, with any of these long-term outcomes uh, as good measures of productivity. Um, and, and I suspect you could each add five of your own to this list, and they'd be equally valuable and useful. The problem is these are all long-term measures, and we have to function in real time. The Congress asks us, what did you do for us yesterday? Right? It, it's, we have to make a funding decision today. We don't have the luxury of waiting five or 10 or 40 years to see whether something turns out to be really, really important. And, and we can all think of very good examples of where that has occurred. Um, and so we, we, we've got to somehow figure out ways of assessing impact in a, on a shorter time frame. Now, to do this, and, and now we're going to talk hypothetically because, and, and obviously part of the reason for coming here today is, is to seek your input as to other ways that we might be approaching this. Um, so we need some sort of validated metric for output or productivity. It, it, we also have got to figure out ways of, of, of codifying the amount of grant support you have, but it just can't be dollars and cents because 
if you do a clinical trial, you will need a different resource set than if you're doing Drosophila genetics. It, they're both great things to do. They just require different amounts of money. And, and so we have to, you know, come to grips with that as well. So I think some of you are aware um, NIH has this tool that they have developed, the relative citation ratio. Um, it's time independent and it's field normalized. That means that glycobiology, which gets no respect, um, you, you don't have to compare it to genomics, although I've been telling Francis for 17 years that DNA is a boring glycoconjugate. Okay? <laughs> Think about that for a moment. <laughs> yeah, right. It's gotten me far, right? But um, the, the point is, though, that you can do this in a, in a field uh, agnostic way, so you, you're only comparing things to the, the field of interest. And we've also validated this. We've, we've gotten, you know, groups of scientists such as yourselves sitting around the table, giving them a bunch of publications to review, ask them is this good, bad, or indifferent, you know, with a whole set of criteria and so forth. And it turns out that the, the gold standard, what scientists think about publications, correlate very well with the RCR index. And I certainly would urge you to read the original paper. Now, we've created this tool called iSight, which is available publicly, and I have it here, uh, that, the link down here. If you haven't played with this, if you're unaware of this, this would be a very useful tool for um, any sort of analytical work that you want to do in your home institution. Um, it, it is um, quite powerful, very fast. Um, so I did a, a quick experiment. I looked up the RCR of some tall, skinny genetics guy named Collins, and I compared it to me, and I, and I quickly learned why he's the director and I'm not, okay? I mean, it's really quite valuable. It really gives you a sense of, of the, the potential impact and influence that one's published work has. And, and, and I mean, all kidding aside, when, when, when you look at it, if you're honest, the papers that you know were really good turn out to have very good RCR values, and the ones that you pushed out the door because the postdoc had to leave and everything they tried turned to not so good stuff and so forth, and you know those papers weren't your finest effort, they tend to have very low RCRs. So now none of you have that latter category, but I have a few of them. So, um, so, so check this out and, and take a look at it. In any event, um, we, we think that there, there are these options to be able to use measures like that, but not exclusively, to, to, to try and, to try and um, um, get a better understanding of, of, of the portfolio and the value. Because we have to come back to this main question. Where's the money going to come from? So right now, it's coming from reprioritization. We, we, we've basically put the ball back in the court of institute and center directors. And of course, every day, institute and center directors are making decisions about priorities. And indeed, next to personnel issues, that's probably the hardest thing that institute and center directors have to do. Um, some institutes and centers use bridge awards to help in this space. Others do not. I mean, it's, a, it's an institute and center specific thing. A number of institutes and centers are using the so-called R35 mechanism, which provides people with a little more money and a little bit longer time, sort of like a mini merit award, if you will, except instead of a merit award, which was sort of a, um, how should you say, uh, you know, lifetime achievement award, if you will, th this is really more about the promise of what the person has going forward. And, and so we think that this might be a way of ameliorating some of this. We are constantly monitoring at the agency level the size of the workforce, the diversity of the workforce. We're trying to figure out the best ways of assessing scientific excellence and outcome. And we're also monitoring the decisions made by ICs so that we get a sense of how heterogeneous we are across the landscape or how homogeneous we are. And as, as many of you know who have been on council for a while, when you've seen one institute, you've seen one institute. 
there, there's tremendous diversity in our institutes and centers at NIH. And ultimately, it is the responsibility of the institute center director to meet the mission of, of that institute or center. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it, it helps us to understand what the, what the landscape um, looks like. Now, we've established um, a working group of the advisory committee to the NIH director, uh, the Next Gen Researchers Working Group. And they're going to help us think through things going forward. Now, this is a very interesting committee. Um, it, it has folks from all levels, graduate students through full professors. And um, so we're, we are generating a very strong diversity of opinion um, on, 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 on the call so far, although we will have a face-to-face -face meeting shortly. The charge, um, as articulated by the NIH director, is to develop goals and implementation strategies going forward to ensure support of, of the next generation of investigators, to identify productivity measures, and to recommend methods to track the impact of any policy um, that, that, that we are going to uh, engage in. Um, and we are going to be engaging the general stakeholder community very, very broadly on this. Um, we will use public meetings and conferences and webinars and so forth um, as we get up to speed with this committee and we'll vet any potential approach that, that we are contemplating. The first uh, sort of check-in by this group will be at the December ACD meeting of the, uh, you know, of, of the Council for the Director. Um, and there will be a, a short presentation just sort of explaining what the framing looks like. The next check-in will be in next June, so roughly uh, 10 months or so from now, where uh, hopefully some initial recommendations will be uh, available. If you're interested in this, um, and I hope you all are at some level, um, I would recommend you bookmark this uh, link and check back uh, to watch uh, the progress um, of this group. Additionally, Mike Lauer, who I think all of you know, um, has been quite uh, uh, active in uh, putting out blog uh, discussions about uh, this topic um, in the uh, so-called open mic uh, uh, blog that he has. Um, and that's another good source of information that uh, you might uh, wish to interrogate. Many, many, many people um, have been involved in this. Um, I, I'd like to call out Tara Schwetz, who's here, who really has spent a tremendous amount of time um, helping me with this. And going forward, um, um, I, I will um, say that uh, the um, um, group that I just mentioned, this working group, will be staffed by uh, Shoshana Kahana, who is right next to Tara. Um, so send all of your hate mail to the, no, no. But, but th this really has been a team effort. And uh, I think, you know, most importantly, you know, we want to thank the many, many stakeholders who took the time to write, whether they were for the GSI index or against the GSI index. The important part was is that people at all levels, from graduate students to presidents of universities, all weighed in. Um, and, and we, you know, we read it all, we listened to it all, um, and hopefully going forward uh, we will come up with uh, a, a better approach, one that people are more comfortable with, uh, to build upon the interim thing that we are now doing. Um, and again, the ACD, uh, you know, really should be uh, applauded uh, for, for all of their efforts as well. So with that, I will stop. I don't think this is a bashful council, but if any of you are bashful, my email address is there. A few of you who know me know that I'm absolutely compulsive about email and answer it all at weird hours of the morning, but I do answer it. Um, and feel free to write me directly if your question or comment uh, goes uh, unanswered today. So thank you. Thank you, Larry. I will open this up for questions.
questions? Aviv, and then Carol. So this was a very interesting and insightful. So you mentioned as an example, I think you referred to in the past, a person would have gotten their first grant at 29, and now it's 45. And some of it is clearly about the delay after you start as an independent person. But some of it is about the extremely long period of time it actually gets to get started as an independent person. And what we've heard in the second part was about people who already start, they had PI status somewhere, and so they could apply. What are the thoughts around mechanisms like, for example, the early independence awards that are actually targeting at pushing people to independence right. much earlier? And right. I would say that the track record of the small number of people who have gone through these paths tend to actually be really good. Right. This is, it doesn't mean that it's low risk. It's so selective today that you can't actually assess whether it's risky or not. Right. But it's something that um, I think we should all be paying more attention to. Yeah, thank, so first of all, um, Mazal Tov. That's a wonderful thing. Um, second, um, it, it, you're right. Um, we think that the Early Independence Award should be exploited further. Um, you, you know, part of, the, part of the problem, though, is the uptake from around the country in terms of institutions that are willing to take a chance has, has not been as strong as I would hope it would have been. Um, and, and so it, that, that's one of the reasons why we are not perhaps supporting many more of these. Um, I, I have attended a few of the um, visits that this cohort had, had here at NIH to present their work. It's, it's stunning. I mean, you're right. I mean, these are, these are great, great young people. Um, and so I wish more institutions would, would be comfortable gambling on somebody who, you know, doesn't have the postdoc, right? You know, um, back 100 years ago in my day, I, I didn't do a postdoc because no one told me I needed to. You know, we just, I just, you know, went ahead and did stuff. Um, but that's, um, you know, today, I, I guess, as institutions see their resources on a thinner and thinner margin, they become more and more risk averse. And anything that this council could contemplate um, in terms of how we might cajole, convince other institutions to take a chance on these folks, that, that would help a great deal. So thank you for the for the presentation. I I, I want to go back to the uh, kind of the metrics. So the publication metrics. So I'm wondering if if consideration is being given to impact of things other than publication. So mm -hmm. resources that are developed, algorithms, software packages. So a lot of times the the initial primary publication for those may not have a very high citation because people use data and resources without citing them. Um, but the actual data set or algorithm or software package or resource has very high impact in the community. And how, how would that get folded into this conversation? Yeah, so, no, thank you. That's a very important point. Um, so genomics is so far ahead of most other fields of science in this regard. Um, so we need to catch up the rest of NIH. We need a way of capturing the algorithm, um, you know, et cetera, uh, so that it becomes citable <laughs> um, and, and, and then give, you know, credit where, where it is due. The, the iSight uh, web um, tool does include things like patents, but, but what you're talking about comes way before that. And, 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 and it's exactly spot on. Um, what, you know, what I would like to see if we fast forward a few years is data sets being formally citable, algorithms being formally citable, et, et cetera. The, the, the mirror side to this, though, and again, I'm, I'm not trying to bash institutions because I do appreciate how hard it is for them, but, but then institutions also have to look at these contributions when considering things like promotion and 
tenure and, and, and so forth. And some do already, which is great, but others not as much. And so if the whole biomedical field makes a broad adoption of this, which the genomics field clearly did years ago, right? Um, it will all be much better off. But yes, ultimately, it's publication, it's patents, it's changes to medical practice, it's algorithms, it's, you know, it's all the things that, that, you, that you have described and then some. We just have to get smarter about how to capture those and make the appropriate attribution. I had two comments from both ends of the age span. Because you really didn't talk about the, the older group and the increase in grants, which I certainly see in my own institution. And I do think it's worth some evaluation of the, the loss of pensions um, and the fact that my generation is really the first 401k generation, and people are very leery about retiring. Um, and, and so I do think probably some more thought about because I think that number may continue to increase. Right. On the younger end, I think one simple thing that is one of the, to me, one of the most annoying NIH rules is around K awards and applying for R01s. There are specific prohibitions of taking these people who successfully competed for K awards mm. and not allowing them to apply for R01s for several years. Mm. I, to me, there's absolutely no logic. Right. And you're, and I mentor many of these people in my own institution, and you're just adding years right. completely artificially. Right. And, and I think your office may want to take on those rules and right. just eliminate them. It, it's, it's very interesting that you bring that up. So some of you, um, certainly from my generation, will remember that the original K award could not be received unless you had an R01. The, in fact, the, the K award research plan was, quote, irrelevant, and it was absolutely distinct from the research, which had to be an R01, okay? So somehow we lost that over the years, um, and, and I want to thank you for reminding me of that, and that is something that we'll bring to the table because uh, it is it's, it's very strange. You know, in terms of the, the, the you know, the 401K uh, generation, yeah. But, but again, it's not about should people in that cohort continue to be professionally active if they wish to be. It's about do they really need a fifth or sixth grant? Right, I agree. I'm just saying I think you're going to have to have an active plan. I don't think that problem is going to get better. Right. I think it is likely to get worse. I, I agree with you, yes. So, so – on the topic of grant mechanisms, you've got to imagine another factor is the change in mechanisms towards bigger and bigger science right. over the years. Um, and as an institute that actively, proactively promotes big science unabashedly, um, I wonder what is the, the impact, though, on, on, um, on this exact issue of, of young investigators getting, getting grants. At the, at the PhD to postdoc level, I mean, I can tell you, and I, I'd be curious to see what other people think, you, you get some great PhDs come through who do not know how to write a research paper, right. who have never, you know, because they have 20 nature papers on their CV as middle author, and, and you know, that creates the issue of are they getting trained appropriately to, right. to really lead these projects. Now, of course, all these things are great to have happen. They produce huge data sets. Is there something we can think about? Well, first of all, is that a concern? Can you look at that analytically right. and, and, you know, for what that factor is? And if it is a concern, is there something an institute like this one can do to, to yeah. work within those big science projects right. to, to make sure we better train people how to write grants and, and run labs? Right. So it, it'd be easy to just say, yeah, it's all genome's fault, so fix it. But, um, but no, I mean, all of science obviously is now heading yeah in that direction. Um, the analyses that we did, just, just to remind everybody, were all based on R01s. So genome had modest impact on the analyses because of exactly what you just said, because of the, you know, need to do big, you know, big science and relatively few R01s, you know, in relation to other ICs. 
Um, you know, so it, it begs the question, do all PhDs um, have to be trained to lead independent research initiatives? And the answer is no, not necessarily. But they have to know what they're getting in for, right? I think we need to be more transparent about what they are being trained for uh, and what the expectations that they have for their success. And so if a young person is, you know, really making enormous contributions as the so-called middle author um, and, is, and is professionally um, content with that, great. But if they somehow thought that that was a springboard to being an independent investigator so that someday they'd have uh, 20 people running around to be the middle authors, that's where I think all of us, not just, of course, the Genome Institute, but all of us need to make sure that we are very clear in articulating what the expectation is, what this career path will do for you, and so forth. Now, of course, they're not mutually exclusive, um, but, but you're right. If you spend, you know, five years or ten years or more being that, you know, absolutely important interstitial worker and then one day wake up and say, well, wait a minute, when, when am I going to get my grant? Then we, you know, then we have a problem. You know, I think we need more truth in advertising then. So it, it's something that we all need to, to come to grips with. We've tried to incentivize through discussion and potential approaches for support, the so-called staff scientist, it, instead of the eternal postdoc, a more professional pathway for individuals who want to be part of the interstitial team. It hasn't taken off because, again, and I, I apologize for sounding like I'm bashing institutions this morning, but again, most institutions are loath to make a commitment during a time when the grant isn't supporting that individual, you see. So if we support somebody for five years and then the, the parent grant is lost, for that to work, the institution's got to make a commitment to say, well, we'll keep you salaried for the one year or six months or, you know, whatever the time interval is. In the, in the old, old, old days where we had something called BRSG, Google it if you don't know what I'm talking about, it was wonderful. Because research deanlets like I could just, you know, plug in some money to keep people going, and you didn't lose this amazing person who had all this background, you know, institutional knowledge and so forth. Today, you know, it just doesn't exist, and so it's very, very hard. You know. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for this presentation. It's good. Um, I. I like the eyesight analysis, but I think like Carol brought up, there's many more things to consider. And I think one thing that definitely needs to be considered in this day and age, and again, I think genomics may be ahead of many fields, is uh, the idea of preprints. Yes. And because many journals do not even allow the citation of preprints, but and since it takes a year or so to publish a paper, if you put a preprint out, it can have a huge impact during that year, which would never really be captured by these metrics. So I think that somehow needs to be. Yeah, no, thank you for raising that as well. And, and indeed, genomics is way ahead, although I think other fields are slowly catching on. Um, NIH has done a number of things, and Eric has been deeply involved in these discussions to catalyze more use of preprints. Uh, we now allow preprints to be cited in grant applications, which I think is a good you know, step forward. Uh, but yes, we, we would need to include that as, as well. You're absolutely correct. Uh, one comment related to that. Google Scholar lets you join preprints and papers so that the counts are added. Yes. Um, you clearly described the need. I, I didn't hear uh, a resolution yet to where you're going to get the money. Um, so a specific question is, where is the money going to come for the 200 that you're going to oh, award next year? Right. So that will be dependent upon each institute and center, and each institute and center director is figuring out where that resource set should come from. The angst, um, and, and there was a lot of angst, but the angst that, that many of the institute and center directors raised is, let me manage my own institute and center. Don't tell me specifically where I have to find this money from. And so, indeed, in the approach that we are now using, that's what's happening, is, is each institute and center will have to figure out where that money will come from. 
Um, and some, and again, every institute's different. Some may have one less big center grant. Some may have a few less R01s to more established investigators or to people who are at all stages of the career but are not doing work that is the highest, you know, highest, highest, um, you know, um, um, mission-related stuff. Um, it will just vary from institute to institute, and we will track that to get a sense of how this all shakes out. Going forward, this next-gen working group of the ACD will try and come up with, uh, you know, perhaps a more robust, rational way to, to help institute and center directors think through um, where they might, you know, look at within their own portfolios. Bottom line, though, it will always be the institute and center director's obligation to, you know, to, to make the priority call. But we hope to do a better job of giving them tools to inform the dis decision. It, it seems you backed away from the cap of, uh, of, of funding. Um, is there no longer a commitment to cap funding for investigators? The, the reason we backed away is that a number of people pointed out flaws in the approach that we were contemplating. To me, the most compelling um, issue was that the way we were um, assessing the amount of support did not fully take into account team science. We, we, we tried some approaches to, to doing that, but, but they were very crude. And I was convinced after many discussions with institute and center directors, including Eric, as well as many stakeholders, that we would be potentially doing harm to team science because we just were, it was just too crude an approach. We've got to figure out a better way of rewarding and accounting for team science if we are to say you have, you know, 10.6 grant units, whatever that means, as opposed to 11, you know. Um, if we are able to do that, and I think you know, really smart people will be able to figure this out eventually. I think then we can revisit it, but only after doing extensive stakeholder discussion, you know, et cetera, um, about potential approaches. Thanks for the presentation. So in, you showed that the distribution of age of our Ds has changed from the 80s to today and express concern about that? Is there an optimal distribution you have, the NIH has in mind? And if so, how do they arrive at it? Yeah, so, so the, the truth is we now are engaging with workforce economists to help us arrive at a, at a scientific um, answer to your question. Um, a a non-scientific answer is um, if you just keep plotting those trend lines, eventually um, the middle disappears, and we don't want to see that happen, obviously. Now, I don't think that that is possible, but so what we are now doing is we're engaging with workforce economists to help us really work through that. Um, there have been some very good publications. Uh, Levitt and Levitt in PNAS uh, published, um, wh which, which is far more sophisticated than I can understand the math, um, of some workforce projections for all of science, not just biomedical research. And they, they come up with um, some rather, um, I'm told, reasonable projections of, of what the workforce could look like. We want folks to hone in on the biomedical research workforce um, and, and come up with similar uh, calculations, again, to be vetted throughout the community to see if it you know, makes sense, but, uh, so we need to do a better job of that, you know, going forward. So I, I want to follow up a little bit on the, on the team science thing, because um, there's a, you know, obviously it's, it's a growing, a growing trend, and there's also a growing trend to have multiple PIs mm -hmm. on, on grants, and to have 
larger grants where you might have multiple subcontracts going out to different people, perhaps at different institutions. Do you have any idea how that's how, how to track that? Because some of the early stage investigators may actually be reasonably well off, but they're not showing up in your in your grants as PIs. Right. So, so again, all of the analysis we did discounted all of that purposely because it, it's as you know it's 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 quite it's quite complicated. Um, going forward. That's one of the things we have to do a better job at. It's, it speaks to what were very crude attempts at, at capturing the essence of the team science going on. Now, that said, I, I, I feel compelled to say the flip side. We heard from many early career investigators, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, that my PI thinks that just because I have a modest sum as a subcontract, that somehow my career is being helped, that's not necessarily the case. And so th there's a balance. You know, and, and in some instances, I'm sure their career is being helped, but in some instances, perhaps not as much as they could be. Just to follow up on, on that last point a little bit, I, I have spent a lot of time at multiple institutions now arguing very strongly that just because you don't necessarily have two or three R01s in your own name, that doesn't necessarily mean you're not being successful. If, you, if you're funding your lab and you're funding your work, however that's coming in, that that should be the, and obviously producing good stuff. That's really the most important thing. But you're right. It's a, it's been a struggle. I've been doing this for 10 or 15 years now. Yeah, and if institutions could get on the same page about this, it would help things a lot. There's, in, in that particular vein, there's a, a particular attention has to be made for computational scientists mm -hmm. to do research because in these kinds of settings, it is often actually for the betterment of their own science to do it as part of something else than to do it in their own R01. Yes. Because when they do it in their own R01, who would actually do the experiments to collect the data, either initially, and even if they have that lined up initially, who will do any follow-ups to know whether the analysis is correct? And that has been, I think, in that sense, the multi-PI R01s, and even more than that, sometimes the bigger grants, have been the place in which the best computational work ended up being done, because there was a framework in which to do this. And the fact is, at the same time, the person had to somehow eke out some, look, you know, standardly looking R01 so that their department chair would say that they have independent funding, sometimes led to completely ridiculous things. It was like a speckle of the actual funding, a speckle of the actual science, but on that, the entire thing hinged. And I do think that the NIH, by stating that that's not how they count things, that would have an impact on departments, besides the fact that we all try to educate our communities right. at the same time. And for computational folks, that's different yeah. than for a lot of experimental. And, and of course, in many ways, the computational scientists are leading the way, right? Yeah. And so they're out ahead. Um, and, and, and so we should be aiming at that and not at, you know, what was, but what is going to be, you know. For me, it's, and I would highlight in that there are two styles of, or actually three styles of computational science that that count for a great deal in, in the context, especially of this institute, but also more broadly at the NIH. There's the software engineering side, which usually tends to have its own grants and its own funding is a big thing, but is actually rarely actually done, uh, is primarily a standard academic PI's business. There's development of new computational methods, right. and there's also a great deal of analysis done by computational analysts. And it's this third part that often yields a lot of the biological insight and tends to work the best as part of something else, right. and not as a standalone. As a standalone, it also doesn't review well in study sections because people are kind of struggling to understand where's the innovation, where's the thing, who would do this, who would do that. Right. And, and we have to make sure that that doesn't get lost because it's more and more what the future right. is going to look like. Oh, very, very good points. Thank you. Larry, do you want to say anything about some of the tools that are being developed, essentially, for us to be able to identify grants that might be right on the edge to try to help? Well, I, well, I mean. Because these are, these are things that are going to sort of, we may be bringing some of those identified grants to this council for discussion. Yeah. So, so what, what, what we're going to do centrally within the office of the director is identify 
um, sort of the next group down that we know the, the individual councils have not yet approved for funding to say, okay, this next set of, you know, if you're at the NCI, this next set of 50, if you're at the, you know, NHGRI, this next set of six, you know, or, you know, whatever the numbers are, are sort of the next ones up for consideration. And it's just used as a, as an aid. It's used as a tool. Um, not all will be funded. We hope many will. Um, but it, it allows us to track, and that is a way of sort of surveying how this is being addressed across all institutes and centers um, at the agency. And depending upon how the institute or center director wants to deal with it, and I think Eric has already given you some insight as to how we will likely deal with it, you know, some will bring it right to the council, others will have staff level discussions, um, you know, just depend on the institute and center. But it partially relates to Mark's question about where is the money going to come from. I mean, that is going to be at the institutes, and it's going to, I mean, it's going to be cases brought to councils. We'll certainly bring it to council. You know, where are these near misses, and then we're going to have to make decisions. Okay, if we want to give the money to these, these sets of grants, it's going to have to come from somewhere. We'll ask you hard questions about what are we not going to fund if we're going to fund these. So, but we'll have tools to identify them. And and we're going to be given. I don't know, targets might be too hard of a word, but just uh, well, we, we want to try to do this corporately across NIH. Yeah. Everybody's got to contribute to try to get there. Yeah, I mean, we, we have a sort of an estimate of what each IC would need to contribute. Yeah, Mark? Um, 200 seems like a modest number. Um, I understand you're just beginning this. Um, what, are your, what are your targets in the future? So if, if you steady state um, a total of 400 over the next five years, that gets you to a steady state of, 2,000-ish. And interestingly enough, that Levitt paper, Levitt and Levitt paper, argued for roughly that level. Um, but again, they're looking at all of science, and we want to focus in on biomedical research. So, But we think we're in the right order of magnitude for sure. Yes, it is a modest number, if, if you think about it. But as, as Eric said, it comes down to, do we fund this or do we fund that? So however modest the overall aggregate number is, it always comes down to do we do this or do we do that? Last word to Val. Oh. <clears throat> uh, thanks for that presentation. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I got stuck on one slide where you said uh, it's harder to get a first grant than it is a renewal. And in my career, one of the things I've been most proud of or was at some point was that I took clinical, uh, well-trained clinical MDs and helped them get basic science uh, R01 grade. In my experience, and, and I was pleased with that, in my experience, they had difficulty getting a first renewal. So I'm wondering if that slide included looked at first renewals separately. Yeah, no, thank you for, for, for raising that clarifying point. There is no question the first competitive renewal is the most difficult. It is the subsequent type twos that get easier and easier with time. And when you're out to, you know, years 55 through 59, it's a piece of cake. Um, so that was an aggregate of all type twos. If we parsed it out, you're quite right. The first competitive renewal will be very difficult. So is there any uh, thought of looking at that? Uh, so, the, so, that, so we are now flagging this as the early established investigators. That's precisely the cohort that make up that second 200 uh, grouping that, that I just referred to. And so... And that's the kind of examples that will be flagged, and I wouldn't be surprised if we're bringing to council for a separate discussion. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Uh, as you can tell, a very relevant discussion both at an NIH level, but also because we will, I'm sure, be tackling this within our own suite of set of grants that we have to consider. And now you can layer on this what's trying to be accomplished more broadly. So thank you, Larry. Thanks for coming. And I'll turn it back to Rudy. Okay, we're a little bit behind schedule. Uh, how about if we try to reconvene at 1.15? New council members, just grab onto a, a veteran and find your way to the cafeteria. <laughs>